you know, the very first sentences of a good book, I'm not saying every book, but, a, but the very first sentence of a good book, the first scene of a good movie, it, it, it's meant to tell you what the story you're about to hear unfold is about, or at least to tell you something about the protagonist of uh, something. And so here's a couple of examples. Uh, it was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. Um, if you don't know that, that's 1984 by George Orwell, just a little setting the tone of reality's been changed. Um, another one, it was, a, it was a pleasure to burn. Uh, that's Fahrenheit 451 by Ray, Bad, Ray Bradbury. Um, I guess the choice of books is kind of telling you a little bit about myself. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, this is actually my favorite. There was a boy named Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. Uh, the, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader uh, by Lewis. That's, it's awesome. That kind of sets the stage for Eustace and who he's going to be in that story. Well, in the Bible, the opening sentence is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The very first words of the Bible tell us that the God of the universe brought all things into existence by the act of his will. And so what I want to do over the next few minutes, uh, VBS Sunday, if you've not been here, we don't give you a full-length sermon because we have a lot going on with the kids. There's a lunch afterwards, and we want to get as many of you to stay as we can. But I do have, um, I'd say a sermonette, a devotion, a little shorter. You can hold me to that, but because I'm a pastor, it's three points. So anyway, it has to be. But before I do that, I just feel like I want to pray. So could you pray with me? Father, what a sweet thing to see this room filled with kids. Uh, that is a gift to us. Uh, Father, we know that not every church has that blessing. Uh, we see it every Sunday when we say the benediction and we end our time, and this room is just filled with kids and families talking and playing. And uh, what a sweet gift that is to us. And so we acknowledge that. We thank you for this week to spend time teaching them about you and who you are. Father, we are so grateful that so many of the folks that attended VBS don't attend this church. Uh, maybe some of their parents are sitting here. Father, we're so grateful for that honor to host them, uh, to hopefully show them some hospitality. Father, I pray that this would be a sweet window into just one of your families, a church, and what it looks like to, uh, to worship you, to come together, to be reminded who you are and the sweetness of that, the fruit of that. So, Father, as we consider this, in some ways, just very, very basic thing, but at times something that we so easily forget, that you are our creator. And as the gospel tells us, even better news, you are our recreator. Uh, Father, thank you for that. And I just pray that this time uh, would be an encouragement to all. Um, Father, speak through me in a way that, in which you get the glory. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Well, listen, so that Again, the very first words of the Bible say that the God of the universe created the heavens and the earth. In fact, in everything that you see, he created. Everything that people didn't see, but now we're seeing, say, maybe through the, the web telescope, which, again, I'm, I'm still geeking out about. I just can't believe what we're seeing in the, the universes and galaxies. And um, The Bible tells us that God created all of that. And in telling us that God created, a couple of things it says that, that didn't happen is that the world was not created through conflict or war, as the creation myths of that time, the ancient Near East, they all said. And so, in that very first sentence, God is stating that he had no rivals, and there were no other gods but him, and that everything that mankind enjoyed was from his hand. In that one simple sentence, it said that. It's also saying that the creation we have around us didn't come about through random change or happenstance. But there's, there's design and purpose in everything we see. It works together because it was designed to do so. And at VBS this week, we were able to celebrate the fact that God creates, created the amazing world that we get to live in, that we get to participate in. And we learned that in Genesis also, he made mankind, men and women, boys and girls, in his image to be representatives of him. That as he is creative, we get to be creative too. We don't create galaxies, but we get to, to be artists or to make things and create things ourselves. And that is a reflection of his image in us, which is, a, again, a tremendous, tremendous honor. 
And as God's representatives, he has called us, men and women, all of humanity, to be stewards of the creation. We're entrusted with it to work. It's part of why here at Creekside, we, we want to lift up the value of work and the vocations we're called to, whether you're full-time ministry or you're a doctor or a homemaker or you're an artist or a lawyer or a doctor, whatever you are, um, that is part of the creation mandate to be stewards of this earth and to be creative with what it is we've been given to do. And in that way, we reflect the nature of God in ways that we don't even think about to each other and to the world around us. And so as I was thinking about that, the fact that God is a creator of everything, he's given us all these things as a gift, he's made us in his image, and we get to use this stuff as the raw stuff of, to create our own food, shelter, um, whatever, just go down the list. Um, that one of the attitudes that this should enlist in us this, as we think about this week, is just simple gratitude. That what we, we've just been given a tremendous resource in this world and this creation that we've, we've been given. And then the privilege to be participants in it. The privilege to not only receive what we've been given from our creator, but also, again, to be participants in it. Um, some of you know, our, I have a, my wife and I have a daughter, and she's gotten into art and ceramics and we just are loving having that around the house. It's just a sweet reminder to me of God's creativity. And um, if you come to our house, we have a life-size figure of a person sitting outside our, our window, which is scary. Um, <laughs> every time I forget about it and there's somebody squatting in my bushes. Um, and then after the fright goes away, after a couple seconds, I'm, oh no, Rosie made this. And look at that. Isn't that, you know, it's, isn't it amazing? There's a person squatting in my ferns. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I love her. It was supposed to be a three-foot figure. It's six foot. So anyway, that's my daughter um, going above and beyond for the A. But, uh, but it, it's just this sweet reminder to me of, uh, of the sweetness of, of creativity and of art. And that person serves no other purpose. That little clay, I don't know. I think it's a woman uh, facing away from me. I can't tell. But... Uh, um, just the, the joy of, of creativity of that. And so that's, a, that's always a sweet blessing every time I stumble across it. Uh, and all that's wonderful news and something to be glad for, but Scripture is full of grace and truth. It not only tells us things that we like to hear, it tells us things as they are, uh, like any good friend would do. And one of the things it tells us that there is, along with the good news, there's unfortunately some bad news. And that's that Genesis also says these image bearers given this incredible heritage uh, rebelled because the seed was planted to not trust this God who made it, that maybe, maybe there's something behind this, that he was keeping them down. And so the image bearers rebelled against God, and they unleashed, unleashed on the world brokenness, selfishness, rebellion, and what Scripture calls sin. And that that sin impacted the entire world and, and every person born afterwards and creation itself. It says that creation is groaning under the weight of that sin. And yet, when mankind rebelled, rebelled, God made a promise that he would redeem these rebels and his creation. Right there at the, in the very beginning of Genesis in chapter 3, right after the rebellion, he promises that this will not stand. There will come a day when he will set things right. And as I was thinking about it this week, think about this. God is all-knowing. So in chapter 1, when God, when verse 1, when God made the heavens and the earth, he knew what was going to happen. He knew we'd rebel, and yet he still made us. He still made the creation. Because he loves us. And he was willing to go through everything that we and he were going to go through. I was thinking, it's kind of like having kids. You love them, you know it's going to be hard, you still have them, and you still love them. Take that times billions, and that's our God. Knowing even more than we might know what our future is, he knew exactly what was coming. Uh, and so we see in Scripture that he promises that he would redeem. And so in God's creativity, uh, not only does he redeem, but he does so, I would say, in a way that's creative in how he redeems a rebellious creation. And he did it by sending Jesus to be the redeemer, and I'll just put this in, or recreator. And that's, that's part of what VBS taught me this week, is that 
Our salvation, when Jesus came to deliver us, he's recreating us. He's recreating what he created at the beginning. So God did this when he promised to send a king who would set things right. And he foretold the birth of this king, his son Jesus, who would redeem, restore, and recreate all that was broken. And everyone expected this Redeemer, this restore, this recreation to be done by using his power and might to overthrow the rebels because that's how you fix things. We're kind of like people that we all have hammers and so everything's a nail or everything's a nail. So anyway, whatever that thing is, if everything's a, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. We expect things to get fixed through power. But instead of sending a general to lead an army, God sent Jesus who healed people. Instead of sending a revolutionary to lead a movement, he sent a servant to teach people and to tell them what God was really like, and to go about healing them and touching them and bringing them back in from the margins into community. Instead of sending someone to conquer the political realms, he sent Jesus who laid down his life as a ransom for sin. And so God recreated, but in a most remarkable way. And he did so because he didn't just want to defeat his enemies. He wanted to turn them into daughters and to sons. Because the truth is, we're all enemies of God before we come to Jesus. We're all rebels. We're all impacted by sin. And to come in and just clean the slate means that we're all wiped off the slate in the cleaning God intended to redeem and to transform people, to make them into a new creation. And that's the tremendously good news. The God who created this great creation, we broke it. And to start over, God came and he sent Jesus to come and to recreate it in such a way that we could be recreated as well, that we could be given new lives, restored. The Apostle Paul, who knew a little bit about recreating hearts, because his was in a dramatic way, wrote this to a church. It's one he hadn't been to from what we know, but it was in the city of Rome, and he reminded them of this. And he said, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to die. But God, the creator of everything we see, shows his love towards us in that while we yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since we've therefore now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more now that we're reconciled shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we've now received reconciliation. He's reminding them because they're, they're wondering, they've come to Christ and has, you know, has God forgotten them? He's like, look, if he loved you when you were enemies of him and he died for you, now that you're, you've trusted Christ and you're in him, how much more is his love going to be shown to you? Because you're his sons and daughters. So this is what the Bible calls the good news or the gospel, as you hear Christians say. We talk about it here, that we as humans are of an inestimable worth as image bearers. And we're also terribly broken and sinful. So much so that we're unable to fix ourselves. We're unable to better ourselves. To set things right. So we needed someone's help to do it. So God sent forth Jesus to be both the one who brings about justice for all the wrongs committed. And also to be the justifier. The one redeeming the ones who've committed the crimes. He does both. He brings both justice and forgiveness and reconciliation. And he does so through the cross. He does so through laying down his life. And the access to that forgiveness that was bought for us on the cross is not through effort and morally holding our breath for as long as you can, thank goodness, but by humility, acknowledging our need, our great, great need, and faith, accepting the payment, the grace, and forgiveness that is offered through Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. One, that we need a Savior, and two, that he's offered it to us. And we're going to receive that forgiveness and that recreation and let God do a work in us. 
And that's amazing, that's amazing news if that's, if that's all of it was, but there's even a little bit more to it. Because the Bible says it doesn't end there because those who come to Christ through faith and are forgiven, it says we're made into new creations ourselves. In a letter to another church in Corinth, Paul wrote this, Therefore, if any was in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, recreating the world, not counting their trespasses against him and entrusting to us this message of reconciliation. I was slipping there of recreation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so, point three, God's creativity is shown through the new creation that he has made us and what we get to participate in. The verse this week was for, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God created beforehand that we should walk in them. When someone comes to faith, they're not only given a future hope, heaven, one day, but a new present reality. They're made new creations now and given the task of good works to do to show that God has recreated them and is offering that to others. You see, God is still creating, but this time it isn't universes and galaxies, but people. He's recreating people right in front of our eyes. He's taking them from spiritual life to death to life. He's making people new creations. And after making them spiritual life, God is giving these redeemed people gifts to use, to bless others, to build people up. God has given us gifts so that we can be engaged in good works to use to serve others, to bring glory to God and to point them. So let me close with this. If you're here and you're not a follower of Christ, know that the one who made you made you for a relationship with him. Just as the kids were singing, we were designed for him. There is something in us that is askew until we enter back into a relationship with the one who made us because that's what we were made for. And in that new relationship, Scripture tells us we're now his workmanship, a new creation given to be the honor of being ambassadors here, to serve, to share the good news both in word and deed, and sharing the gospel and in the, in the way that we live our life, in the way that we treat others, and that we show and put on display the love of God that we've experienced as we interact with other people. You know, in the same letter to the church at Rome, Paul said, you can tell there's a good and powerful creator just by looking around at the world, at nature, and see what a tremendous gift you have. The good news is the creator didn't walk away from his creation when it rebelled, but he set out to bring it home, and he made that possible through Jesus. And that's what we come together and we celebrate every week. So Creekside, would you pray with me? Father, thank you first and foremost that you are a good creator. As we look at the world, even as we look out the window here and we think of how many shades of green did you make just within our eyesight? Uh, how many species, how many different terrains, how many different, and now we look up to the sky, how many different galaxies, how many different nebula making new star, stars? I just, it's just, it's beyond our ability to comprehend. But it shows a bit of your holiness, your otherness, your power to create, and also your goodness to create. So we thank you for that. But Father, as good as that is, we praise you for your skill and your creativity, but Father, we are and will be eternally grateful for your kindness and your mercy and your grace. Because when we rebelled, you didn't walk away, but you set out to rescue us and to redeem us. Thank you for that. Father, I pray that if someone is here and is wondering what you're like, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them. For those of us who have walked with you for many years, continue to restore our hearts to make them fresh. Forgive us when they become still and dull and stagnant. Stir our hearts. Renew us. 
We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your son's precious name. Amen.